Um, so we'll keep uh, talking a little bit about EMIND and uh, some of the results uh, from, from this first decade of, of EMIND. The nice thing about uh, being uh, one of the last presenters is that uh, John, Ellen, and Colin uh, have already covered much of the background of EMIND, so I have uh, a lot of time to show actual results. So um, today I'm going to talk about, uh, take a similar approach as the one as, as Ellen did uh, with uh, understory vegetation. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm going to do it um, looking at, at animals, in particular case invertebrates and, and songbirds. So before that, uh, just a refresher. Mm -hmm. So EMIN, uh, the, the, the different treatments that have been imposed into the EMIN experiment are particularly targeting to a given retention of, uh, of trees after harvest. So uh, we have this uh, succession of retention levels from 2% uh, or, or, or clear cut areas up to uh, no, no harvesting, so basically our controls. And uh, we have these machine corridors and uh, the different uh, extraction of trees from each of the different treatments. So basically the 75% retention harvesting is only uh, the, the trees extracted from the machine corridors. And uh, as we go down into lower retention levels, um, the, the treatment started to extract trees from those uh, retention strips. And that's how the, the different uh, uh, retention levels were, were created. So um, basically, we all know that harvesting has uh, significant effects on different components uh, of the forest, right? So we know that forests are complex, and, and we know that uh, many, compo these, many of these components are um, somehow unpredictable, but what we know that is predictable is that forest harvesting has a significant effect on many of these components. So if we think about uh, harvesting on forest structure, we know that harvesting has a, a significant effect on the tree density and DBA and uh, basal area uh, distribution over a landscape. Uh, also, it will have an effect on the tree composition and how these trees uh, recover, these species recover from, from uh, disturbance. Uh, also, it will have an, an impact on the snag and, and coarse with debris uh, composition in, in, in these uh, harvested landscapes. And uh, in general, it will also have a, a direct effect on, on the understory level, as, as Owen showed. Um, so we would expect that these changes in forest structure will lead to subsequent changes in, in the, the fauna and flora that habit these, these systems, right? So I'm going to focus on species richness and composition, and particularly I'm going to focus on these three taxa that are shown in there. So I'm going to focus on spiders, which is my specialty, and I'm very happy to talk about them. Uh, I will talk about carabid beetles, which are pretty cool, but not that cool as spiders. <laughs> and they will talk about uh, songbirds, which eat spiders. <laughs> but anyways, so I'm just going to show you a couple of slides here, uh, kind of uh, showing some of these changes in forest structure after harvest. So basically here what we have is on the x-axis of these graphs uh, are different time periods. So we have the pre-harvest, two years, five years, and 10 years after harvest. And on the top figure, uh, we have a tree basal area. The bottom figure, uh, it's uh, tree density. And the different bars are the different treatments. So we, we have uh, the transition from clear cuts to unharvested controls. So if we look at tree density, um, if we look at tree basal area, sorry. You can see that, of course, pre-harvest, there was not pretty much any effect of, har of harvesting because there was no harvesting at all, right? But once we apply these harvesting prescriptions um, in, in, on that landscape, you can see that there was an actual uh, treatment effect on a basal area. This is pulling all the trees uh, with DBH above five centimeters. So we can see that, yeah, there's, there's kind of a very nice progression of uh, basal area, total basal area, depending on the prescription that was applied. So uh, of course, the, the larger uh, retention, the larger basal area you will, you will retain. But interestingly, when we look at tree density, in the first uh, five years after harvest, you see that progression. But 10 years after, you see that basically clear cuts 
the 10, 20% and 50% retention are no different from each other in terms of tree density. And it's just basically a result of the influx of, of recruitment. So of course, once you open Canopy, you get a lot of recruitment, mostly um, Aspen recruitment. And over the 10 year span, all these little uh, saplings become trees, and now they are part of these results here. So, so you can see that there are some differences in structure related to how the, the sizes distribute among treatments and how the densities of, of these trees uh, relate to the, to the, to the corresponding uh, treatment effect. So since recruitment is so important, we can start looking at how recruitment changes depending on the harvest treatment and also depending on the forest cover type. So here we have four panels, uh, one, each one uh, depicting uh, one of the four cover types uh, included in the Imen experiment. And uh, on the y x axis, we have the retention treatments. So R0 is uh, the clear cuts, and it goes uh, in the progression to, towards uh, controls. And uh, on the y axis, we have the mean uh, recruitment density. So you can see that, yes, of course, once you open the canopy, there is a lot of recruitment. The more you open the canopy, the more recruitment you get, right? That's, that's something that it's quite expected. What it is very interesting is that you see that depending on what cover type was before harvesting, recruitment will change. Deciduous dominated stands, of course, will regenerate into deciduous stands, right? The, the, the rate of, uh, of uh, suckering of aspen is much, much greater than, for example, in, in conifer stands, where recruitment is very important as uh, retention decreases, but is much less important uh, than, for example, in the city stands where we have 25,000 uh, stems per hectare compared to, to conifer stands where we have about 10,000 stems per hectare, right? And then you can see that the, the change over time, the change in recruitment as well. So the, the, the top lines in all these graphs are the five year period. So we have an, a very large influx of recruitment in these very first five years of, uh, after harvest, and then recruitment diminishes. And I guess it's just because there's so much already over there that there's a lot of competition, and uh, somehow recruitment uh, tends to, to decrease uh, over the 10-year period, right? So of course, if we are looking at all these, all these uh, forest changes, we would expect that biodiversity will change as well. As Ellen showed, as Colin showed, and as uh, John introduced in, in, his, in his talk. So now let's look at, at some, some results. So these graphs are, uh, I'm going to show three slides which are exactly the same, one for spiders, one for beetles, and one for songbirds. So we are looking at the, the number of species according to retention, right? Uh, you know that there's no control here. The control are these lines over here, right? So we are comparing everything towards the control. And you can see that, yeah, for sure, once you harvest, at least for spiders, there's a significant decrease in species richness regardless the cover type, right? However, uh, you, can, you can see that depending on the forest cover type, recovery is different. So recovery is different uh, in, in deciduous stands, for example, versus conifer stands. You can see that in conifer stands, nearly none of the retention uh, treatments have recovered to the uh, reference control. Whereas in, in, the, in deciduous and deciduous with spruce understory, 10 years after, we, we are seeing the same number of species that, were, uh, that are in the controls. So these are great news, but it's not the, the whole story. You remember that you, you need to uh, acknowledge that we can have the same richness as there was 10 years before, but that doesn't mean that you have the same composition. So you can have the same numbers, but they could be totally different species, right? Now, when we look at, at carabid beetles, the story is a little bit different. You see that the, regardless the cover type, uh, richness has recovered over time, uh, regardless as well the, the treatment effect. However, you can see that in most cases, the bars go way, way above the reference controls. And this is just showing us that mostly all these sites are just being uh, colonized by op open habitat species. And they are just increasing the number of, of, of species in, the, in, the, in, the, in that local pool just because 
now you have, you have a mixture of probably all these open habitat species and species that remained after harvesting. Uh, now if we look at, at the songbird species richness, uh, the story is more or less similar as, as for, for carabid beetles. In some forest cover types, uh, species richness increases even above the reference controls, uh, whereas in, in, uh, in other cover types and treatments, uh, the, the, is the reverse. So this kind of start to make us think about, okay, different assemblages respond differently to harvesting, and this response is also a, um, a product of the forest cover type where these assemblages thrive, right? So it's a very complex system where you have disturbance and you have pre-disturbance conditions as well that interact and determine how uh, richness uh, change over time in, 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 in this area. So now let's, let's think about composition, species composition. So Ellen showed um, a bunch of ordination plots uh, in her talk. I'm going to show again a few more. So just a reminder, uh, this is just a, a way to see how assemblages change uh, in relation, in this case, in relation to time to cover type and to uh, the, the harvest treatment. And um, when we think about composition, we are not only thinking about the number of species, we are thinking about what species are there, so the identity of the species matters, and in what relative abundance they are. So you can have the same species in two sites, but in one site is one species may be way, way more abundant than in another site, right? So when, when we think about ordination, like uh, all each of these points in, in the graph represent one of the compartment, one of the human compartments. And uh, the, the way ordination works is that you look at that uh, difference or dissimilarity. So two points that are very close together basically tell that uh, the species composition in those two specific compartments is very similar. And two points that are far apart from each other it just meaning that uh, the, the assemblage composition in those two sites is very different. So uh, if, if we look at the time component only, you can see that, yeah, there have been some, cha so, some change in species composition over time. Regardless, you look at spiders, beetles, or birds, you see that there's a significant change over time, right? So, so these blobs over here, these uh, bubbles, are basically a measure of um, how spread uh, those sites are around the group. So in this case, we're looking at how much variation you get two years after harvesting or five years or 10 years after harvesting. So the degree of overlap of these, of these blobs are, is basically a measure of, um, of no difference, right? So if we see uh, bubbles that are overlapping a lot, we are just basically assuming that the composition in these sites are not very different. So in this case, you can see that there is a progression of change over time, regardless which taxa you are looking at. So of course, once you open the canopy, species composition changes. And as time goes on and the forest recovers, of course, there will be some changes in composition as well, right? Mm -hmm. Which in the case of spiders, we can see that there's a very abrupt change between the two year and the five year and, uh, interval. Whereas for, for beetles and, and uh, songbirds, songbirds uh, this transition is more, more progressive. Now, if we look, if we look, about, if we, if we look at the forest cover type, we also see that there are some differences in composition among cover types. Is, uh, essentially what, uh, what Ellen showed uh, before, right? So we know that depending on what forest cover type you have, you will have different species assemblages associated to these forest cover types. And, um, and you can see that in, in, in either case, either spiders, beetles, or, or birds, there is that transition in uh, assemblage composition from deciduous dominated stands towards conifer dominated stand. So it's kind of like following that uh, traditional view of forest succession in, in, the, in this part of the world, right? Uh, so, so you can see that that transition is, uh, is, a, is a, a mode among the three different uh, taxa in here. So we know things are changing, right? Over time, uh, assemblages are changing, composition is changing, 
but this change is also a function of the cover type uh, that, that we are interested in, right? So just, just uh, to point out, uh, you can see that in the case of spiders and beetles, the change is vertical. And in the case of birds, the change is horizontal. In RDA, or in, in, in ordination in general, the, the more important gradients are shown in the, in, the, in the horizontal axis, whereas the secondary gradients are shown in the, in the vertical axis. So this is kind of showing us that for birds, forest cover type is very, very important. But for beetles and spiders, there is something else that is more important than cover type, which is also, which is important, but not as important as something else. And that something else, what, what could it be? Uh, harvesting, right? So if you look at, at, these, uh, at these ellipses here, at these, uh, at these circles, you see that in the case of birds, you s there, there are changes in cover type, there are differences in cover type, but they converge at this point. And um, that convergence, you don't see them in, in the spiders and, and the beetle assemblages. So when we look at the, at, at the retention treatment, that's where we can start looking at the whole picture, right? So now we see in, in spiders and beetles that uh, we have that, that retention gradient. So we are, we are seeing that the assemblages are changing gradually after you leave more and more and more and more retention until you get to the controls for the three assemblages. But now the, the, the harvesting treatment in spiders and beetles goes on that horizontal axis, which is the most important one. So for, for beetles and spiders, harvesting plays a much greater uh, role in uh, determining how assemblages, uh, uh, how, how these groups of, 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 of uh, invertebrates assemble. Whereas for birds, in the, as in the previous slide, it was based on, on cover type, right? Here in, in birds, you see that transition in retention but uh, it's in, in that vertical uh, component. So you can see that the that, that convergence of uh, composition in the different cover types in the case of birds is just basically converging towards the clear cuts. So for birds, it's very important to have greater retention, right? And that greater retention will re retain some of those uh, aspects that are specific for each cover type that are very important for birds. And th this gives us a, a very nice idea that maybe beetles and spiders are responding to a different spatial scale than the birds do, which makes a lot of sense. Beetles and spiders are much smaller and they have uh, lower dispersal rates than birds who can fly and can move much, uh, in much uh, greater, greater areas. So, so these give us a very nice understanding of how uh, time, cover type, and the, the, the retention treatment are interacting in very complex ways, depending as well on the, on the taxon that you are looking at. So we cannot generalize by looking at only birds or looking only at plants or looking only at invertebrates. We kind of need to look at the whole picture to, to have a much better uh, understanding of what is going on, right? So now this links back to the idea of, of disturbance, right? So we are dealing with, with a landscape that is a product of natural disturbances. Uh, in, in our particular case, it's a product of fire, wildfire. And of course, that landscape is recovering from wildfire, right? So the, whatever a fire is doing on the landscape is affecting the species composition over time uh, on, that, on that landscape. And now in addition to natural disturbances, we are applying a further uh, another uh, disturbance on that landscape, which is a human disturbance, in this case uh, forest harvesting, in which we still see some recovery uh, of course, the, the, the forest regenerates after disturbance, and now we have a community effect of a natural disturbance and uh, a human disturbance. So this is what, uh, what we think about of how that uh, pre-harvest condition has a memory on the post-harvest uh, composition of species. And uh, we call that uh, ecosystem memory. And uh, they talked about very briefly uh, about this uh, in the morning.
So we can, we can predict uh, this uh, fire history based on, on, on the tree composition, as, as Colin showed. And we know for, from Ellen's talk and, and this talk that the tree composition has an effect on, on the current uh, species assemblages. So we can use those two pieces of information to actually attribute how much variance in the present assemblages is, uh, is attributed to either one of these two components, right? So, so we can think that, uh, that what we see today is a product of what, what, uh, of what happened before harvesting and what happened after harvesting. And the cumulative effect will be basically the interaction of those two. So we can, we can think, uh, we can put this into a, into a bar in which we know the variance explained only by history, like uh, fire history, variance explained only by harvesting, and the variance explained by the combination of the two. So we can see here that different taxa respond differently in, that, in these two different scales, right? So in the case of spiders, we can think about a large ecological amnesia where harvesting plays a very, very important role and there is very, very, very little uh, history involved uh, early after harvest and this uh, ecological memory starts to be gained over time. Whereas for uh, beetles is the other way around. There's a, a big component of this ecological memory after harvesting, and um, and uh, we are we are losing that memory over time. So to to finish up, there's the big question: Is variable retention better? Yes, for sure. It's much better than no retention. It pr provides uh, habitat heterogene heterogeneity. Uh, it reduces all these uh, negative impacts of, of extensive clear cutting. So for sure, um, variable retention is uh, it's a viable alternative to, to clear cutting. It, it retains some of these forest specialists that, that we need to maintain in the landscape. Uh, but there are many, many, many issues that we have to think about. So. As I said before, we cannot base our, our decisions on a single taxon. We need to think about more in the big picture, looking at different responses to different taxa. And um, based, based on these results and the, the ones that Ellen showed earlier, um, we, can, we can start seeing that probably that 10% retention threshold is good but is not optimal if we want to maintain for a specialist on the landscape, right? So there's no, no single magical threshold for, for, um, for forest retention depending on the objectives that, that you have. So then we have to need to think about on, on natural disturbances and all the idea of how these natural disturbances play uh, a very, very fundamental role into shaping communities in addition to the, the human disturbances, in this case, uh, forest harvesting. So basically, we know that uh, human disturbances and natural disturbances are not analogous, right? But we can use the patterns uh, to recreate some of these uh, natural disturbances based on forestry, but um, we really need to understand what processes go underlying these patterns. And the only way of knowing that is through long-term experiments like IMINT or like other experiments around in which we are able, we will be able to see this linkage between process and pattern. So basically the, the main message is that yes, we need to, to think about not only what's going on in the present, but what has happened in the past, as Colin uh, showed in his talk.